Hello, everybody. This is Pastor Orsted coming to you from St. John's Lutheran uh, Church on the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Let us begin with a word of prayer. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people faithfully, feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us whole people, that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first lesson today is written in the prophet Jeremiah. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel is written in the gospel according to St. Mark, reading the sixth chapter. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went to shore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to a land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever he, they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus the Christ. Much is made of shepherds in today's lessons, in the psalm, in the Old Testament lesson, and in the gospel we hear about shepherds and sheep. The prophet Jeremiah announces God's disgust with the leaders of Israel who have let God's people be scattered and victimized. These shepherds, as Jeremiah refers to them, are false and do not have the well-being of the flock foremost in their mind. One might say, instead of shepherding the flock, they've been busily fle fleecing it. 
God, the prophet tells us, will himself shepherd the sheep. He will punish these false shepherds, and he will gather the sheep and tend to them, protect them, and feed them. Unlike the false shepherds who have allowed things to get so messy, God will bring order and nurture the sheep back into health as God's own flock, gathering them from the four corners of the earth so that they can again be his people. Psalm 23, maybe the most popular psalm out there, is a comforting comforting and poetic lyric hymn about God the protector, the one who shepherds and accompanies his people into peace and life, ushering them through the shadow of death into a new place of peace and plenty. This metaphor as God as shepherd and as the people as sheep is raised repeatedly in scriptures, I think with good reason. Consider for a moment the sheep. Sheep, I am told, are stubborn and short-sighted, apt to wander off on their own and seek their own way. They have no natural defenses against predators except to flock together and to try to not be the one chosen, and no sense of direction. I recently saw a video of a sheep uh, that someone showed where the shepherd uh, pulls him out of being stuck in a ditch. As soon as he is put down, the sheep takes off running again and ends up back in the very same ditch. That is a very good picture of what sheep are like. Despite the occasional objection, most of us, you and I, I think find the metaphor of God the shepherd and we as his sheep to be a comfort, a source of strength and encouragement in our own worst moments. The image of God not only driving us out, but calling us back together, gathering us, is an irresistible statement of how God wishes to relate to his people. The sheep know the shepherd, and they follow him, recognizing his voice. So in our psalm, the second lesson and the gospel today, the sheep are pictured as following the shepherd, recognizing him, listening to the shepherd's voice, going where it leads. But I wonder sometimes, do we as sheep of Christ, our good shepherd, always follow him? Do we as sheep of Christ's flock always recognize and listen to his voice? I think sometimes we do and sometimes we do not. I think there is a, be a natural response in us to allow ourselves to listen to voices that are not his. Imagine for a moment a time in which you feel endangered or under stress or afflicted in some way. The natural response at those times is to become afraid and fear leads to panic and panic leads to the most chilling mistakes. The major one among those is listening for any voice we can find, not just the voice of our good shepherd. When I was very small, we had relatives down uh, in um, Southern Ohio that we would go visit. Two of them were my mom's great aunt and great uncle, and they lived on what remained of their farm that, I had fa that they had farmed before they became too old to do so. They were still pretty spry, and so they were able to get around and to live on their own. And when we visited them, Aunt Mary would always throw a feast on the table. She would say, let me get just a little something for you to eat. And pretty soon there would be roast beef and chicken and vegetables and puddings and cakes and pies laid out on the table for us. We'd drive down there, at least in the summer months, every few weeks just to visit and to enjoy their company. Now, near their farm, there was still an active farm and it had a cornfield. As you know, corn can grow rather tall. And I, as a seven or eight year old boy, wasn't all that tall myself. So I tended to wander around the farm and see what trouble I could get into. One day I wandered into the cornfield and before I knew it, I had lost my sense of direction. 
I turned here and there. I looked all around, and I began to panic. And in my panic, I began to run. And as I ran, my panic increased. And then I didn't pay any attention whatever to what direction I was going until finally I broke out into the clear on the other side of the cornfield. Now that other side of the cornfield was literally the next valley over from where my aunt and uncle lived. As I came out of the cornfield, I recognized nothing. I didn't have any idea where I was. And so I had to find myself to a road and on the road, I began hitchhiking. This is back in the day when you could sort of still do that. And a woman and her children picked me up. When they picked me up, I was so glad. I told her where I came from and that I was visiting my Aunt Mary and she took me back to their farm. I was so relieved. Fear leads us to panic and panic leads us astray. Consider for a moment that you're a parent in a crowded store or other crowd and your child who you have with you wanders off. You begin looking around and as you look around and you don't find him or her, naturally you begin to panic and you begin to yell out the child's name and the panic will keep rising until the uh, child hears your voice and responds. The same thing happens to the child when he or she becomes lost. The panic rises until they hear the voice of their parent, a sound that promises comfort and safety, direction and security. The gospel breaks with the first two lessons in that it doesn't name Jesus as shepherd in, specific, in a specific way. And yet, Jesus acts like a shepherd. We're told that when he gets off the boat in Gennesaret, he sets his eyes on the crowd, all of them scrabbling to reach him, to touch his garment, to be in front so they can hear him, <clears throat> excuse me, or to get into a position where they can sit down and listen, or to get the pallet with their friends or relatives into a place so that Jesus can heal them. And of course, what all those people have in common is that they somehow feel lost. Their disease has cut them off. Their anxiety and fear has overwhelmed them. The stress of their lives has broken them. Their panic at not being able to feed or clothe or support themselves is rising. And Jesus looks upon all of them and we're told he has compassion. Actually, the Greek word is a little more like he has a knot in his bowels because the bowels is where the ancient world located the source of emotions and feelings. So it wasn't that he thought about them, it was that he felt for them. You get the picture. Jesus felt compassion when he saw the crowd so needy and so eager to hear him. They needed to be healed. They wanted to be touched to overcome their losses. And that evokes a strong response in Jesus. We're told as he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And it is in the teaching and the touch of Jesus that the people, the sheep, find the shepherd they want and need, a one they are so desperate to find, a one they are so desperate for that they've dropped everything to run to the next town and to the next, and to the next, trying to get there before he does, or at least before he leaves, because they need at least to touch the fringe of his garments, at best to hear what he is saying, and to have him heal them or their relative. There are so very many voices speaking to us today in our world. I've been reading recently about all the false shepherds out there, the ones who are claimed to be leaders and yet only want to fleece those who would follow them, to, to uh, use them in order to get power and wealth and not to serve them at all. These are the type of people Jeremiah warns us against, the type of people that God promises to, to uh, punish in their day. All of these people, these voices, 
trying to impersonate the one whose voice we really need to hear. Not only our false leaders, but also advertising and businesses and other people trying to manipulate us with extravagant promises they can't keep. They know they can't keep, we know they can't keep, and yet they demand that we surrender ourselves to their control. They promise us many things. They speak to us in, with influential, manipulative, and seductive voices, promising that if you buy this or buy that or buy into whatever they're hawking, your life will become more fulfilled, pain-free, less encumbered, less stressful. The message, whether it comes from advertisers and businesses or false leaders or false prophets, the message is always that if we give in to the endless greed and consumerism that they tell us to, that our lives will become idyllic and that we'll have everything we ever want or need. My favorite is drink the right beer and you'll be surrounded, guys, by beautiful women. Or wear the right clothes, girls, and you will be surrounded by handsome men eager to take you out and uh, for a night on the town. These endless messages of greed and consumerism tell us that just one more thing, just one more expenditure, just one more, just one more. You must have this, you that, or that. You can have anything you want or anyone you want. You can satisfy your every want. You can have it all, baby. You must have this. You must have that. You can do anything. Satisfy your every need. Just earn it. Work for it. Spend it. But those voices are not the voice of Christ. And that message is not the message of the gospel of Jesus. That message is a message of death. And those voices are sirens leading us away from the source of all life, killing us, sapping our spirits and our lives by leading us into the dead-end ditch, ditch of self-centeredness and isolation. Because you know and I know, our ultimate needs can't be met by buying and possessing more consumer goods any more than they can be met by acquiring power and exercising violence against those around us. And yet, and yet the voices of a thousand and one false prophets tell us that salvation is ours if only we buy enough, have enough, force our way enough, in increase our influence. In the movie The American President, Michael Douglas acting as the president and Annette Bidding as his girlfriend, the president one day snaps as his enemies take aim at him for having a relationship with Bidding's character and then begin to assassinate Bidding's character. He has enough and he goes into the press room and he says something like this. You know how you become popular? You get people, most of them older, in a room and then you lie and you paint an imaginary picture of how things used to be and then you tell them things aren't like that anymore and you tell them who's to blame and you make them afraid. And that's how you get popular. False prophets tell us we must compete against each other, that you won't have enough food if we feed the hungry, that you won't have a job if we employ more people or allow immigrants in. They tell us our homes will be taken away if we give the homeless a place to rest. They tell us we should fear each other because the only security is in making you afraid of me. According to Robert Wasnack, we now have a two-class society, the information rich and the information poor. In such a world, information becomes power. But the irony of our age is that the very information technology that only a few years ago we were boasting about and that was supposed to liberate us has begun to control us. Our new information-based technology has brought us neither earthly bliss nor eternal salvation. In a world with so much information available that none of us can possibly absorb even a small fraction of it, it's become tricky to know just what information is central for our lives, just what information is accurate, just what voices are telling the truth, 
and what voices are not. In a world with so many voices over so many cables and computers, we are beginning to wonder whose voice we should listen to. Well, there are many fraudulent voices out there. Many voices on the internet and even on the telephone and the radio and the television trying to pull the wool over our eyes. Many fraudsters willing to fleece us in order to increase their own power and wealth and comfort and ignoring whatever it is that we need or want in order to make our lives better. The question becomes, do we listen to them or do we recognize them for what they really are as false voices leading us away from the voice of Christ, our good shepherd? God calls us to follow his voice, a voice of real deliverance, a voice that will lead us to peace, not conflict, a voice that will lead us to still, fresh, and pure water, not to a battle with each other over polluted lakes and rivers in a desert of our own making. Psalm 23 goes even further than this, proclaiming that our God, our shepherd, is so good and so generous that he not only gathers us together, he invites us into the table of plenty as our enemies watch. The psalmist reminds us that the voice of the Good Shepherd is the one who protects us and waters us and feeds us and cares for all our needs. He is the shepherd who promises us that one day we will hunger and thirst no more. Sun and scorching heat will not strike us. He will guide us to springs of living water and wipe away every tear. That's an amazing promise. God is not the angry judge waiting to, waiting to clobber us sinners that others would say. He's not sitting there waiting to punish the gays or the Democrats or the Republicans or the Mexicans or Salvadorans or Chinese or Russians. God is not there waiting to punish those who step out of line of whatever narrow morality we might imagine he is enforcing on us. No. God is the good shepherd, calling us to he who alone can truly impart life and abundance himself. I am convinced, more than convinced, that if we listen to his voice, we shall always be with him and he with us. And that if we do listen to his voice and we do dwell with him and focus our lives on him, we'll begin to figure out which voices in the world are telling the truth and which are not. We'll begin to understand the motivation of those who are telling us things and begin to understand who we can listen to and who we can't. Because first and foremost, it is the voice of Christ who delivers us from confusion and sickness and death and despair. The question for us becomes today this, do you believe the promises of all other voices in our world or the promises of God's world? Are you listening to the voices of so many in our world today who are trying to divide us from one another? Or are you listening to our Good Shepherd's voice who seeks us to gather us into a community of faith and safety and plenty dwelling in the abundant mercy of God? I know who I want to listen to, and I know, I think, who you want to listen to. Let us help one another as we seek to listen only to God and to the voice of the Good Shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ, whose death and resurrection and compassion for us has made it possible for us to celebrate life unending. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us now pray for all people in Christ and for all the world according to their need. Each petition ends with, hear us, O God. Your response can be, your mercy is great. O God, tend to your church. 
encourage bishops, pastors, and deacons in their proclamation of the gospel, raise up new leaders and encourage those pursuing a call to ministry, embolden all the baptized to embody your love and justice. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Restore your creation, O God, sustain croplands and pastures, and safeguard all farm animals and livestock, preserves lakes, rivers, and streams that offer refreshment, revive lands recovering from natural disasters, protect coastlands threatened by rising oceans, restore forests devastated by fire. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Reconcile the nations, O God, Break down the dividing walls that make us strangers to one another and unite us as one human family. Equip leaders to deal wisely with conflict and guide diplomats who seek peaceful solutions. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Heal your people, O God. Look with compassion on immigrants, exiles, and all who are afraid or feel lost. Give rest to those who are weary comfort to those who are grieving, and recovery to those who are ill, especially those we name before you in our hearts. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Nourish this congregation and all the congregations of your people, O God. Prepare a table where we receive food for our hungering spirits. Renew our commitment to provide for one another and revitalize our ministries of feeding and nurturing hungry neighbors. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You lead us home, O God. We give thanks for all who have died, now citizens with the saints. As you have received them into your heavenly home, so welcome all of us to dwell in your house forever. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Have a good and blessed week. Go and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.